It is a great pleasure to be here as a supporter of Blue Metropolis, and especially of its LGBTQ plus programming. I've loved Blue Met from its early days for its diversity, diversity of languages, of cultures, of writing styles. That diversity proudly includes queer authors and themes, not just in standalone pro events, but woven into the fabric of the full festival. The pandemic has temporarily exiled me from Montreal, but the online format is letting me fully participate from the Acadian shore of New Brunswick. Bon festival, tout le monde. Queer dreaming, the gaps between feeling and survival, pleasure and loss, connection and controversy, desire and joy. Um, hi, everyone. I'm David Bradford, a poet, editor, and the Associate Coordinator of Programming and Communications here at the, the Blue Metropolis International Literary Festival. And I'm really excited for tonight's mutual interview with Matilda Bernstein Sycamore and Randa Girard, um, a headlining event of this edition of the festival's queer programming. Um, before I go any further, though, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that Blue Metropolis operates in Chochage, Montreal, on the unceded territory of the Ganeen-Gahaka Nation. This place has been one to gather for First Nations for a long time, something that the festival and surely myself want to not only name, but also critically encounter and engage in our work both here and across Turtle Island. Now, I'm thrilled to present Randa Girard, author of Love is a Next Country and Matilda Bernstein Sycamore, author of The Freezer Door. And I'm so excited we were able to bring them together in this way. I think it's such a special opportunity to have two renowned award-winning queer authors that are friends, that know each other's trajectory, that are invested in each other's practice, have the kind of public delving into each other's work that might not be possible outside of this kind of one-on-one -on -one conversation. I'm so happy they're both here and I can't wait to hear what they have to say. So welcome to everyone out there watching. Please welcome Matilda Bernstein Sycamore and Randa Girard. Yay, so good to be here. So good to be here with you virtually in Montreal. Hello, Montreal. <laughs> hello, Montreal and hello, Matilda. <laughs> Do you want to start by reading, Rhonda? Yeah, I'll read. I'm going to read from my book, Love is the Next Country. Um, I will read from the West Texas 2016 chapter. In Marfa, in Marfa, one of the women writers staying at the Lannan Foundation flipped over on her bicycle and had someone drive her to my house. He knocked on the door and shouted, your friend is in the car and needs your help. I came out to find her biting down on a bloody towel. My fucking teeth got knocked out, she said, and I helped her get in my car and gave her a pack of ice. We drove to the nearest dental emergency place, a trailer 30 miles east. We passed a giant border patrol blimp and I tried to distract my friend who had done terrifying journalism work and was now obviously too vulnerable and battered by the actual fucking soil of Texas. In the trailer, my friend allowed me, someone she didn't know very well, to care for her. I took deep breaths and promised myself after each one that I wanted to get better at letting others love me. A week later, I kept that promise to myself and I invited my friends E and A, old neighbors from Austin, to come visit me. I delighted the sight of them in my driveway, the two of them gorgeous and smiling. Together, we drove to the Marfa thrift store where we saw three Confederate flags in a vase. I asked the cashier, an ex-New Yorker, why they had them. He said they were donated and that we could have them for free because he knew we would destroy them. We put them in the trunk, then took them to a field and destroyed them. We wanted to set them on fire, but the desert was dry. In the morning, we drove 54 miles through the high desert out to Balmorea State Park, home to the world's biggest spring-fed natural pool. There, we each received citations for drinking beer by the water. Other people were drinking out of koozies or hiding their liquor in the cooler. We were drinking openly and gaily and Officer Teal did not like that. I argued with him for half an hour, but he just gave me an additional note on my citation for language. He categorized me as white. I told him I was not white. 
He asked what I was. I told him. He put me down as white anyway. The pool was full of small fish and catfish. We left as soon as Officer Teal was gone. At night, we made shadow puppets in front of the Catholic church in town, and I rang the church bell and thanked the nun for her service to Jesus. I pissed on a fire hydrant. We disturbed a man named Bill, a visual artist, and he led us into his studio. We climbed up to his roof and climbed back down. Thank you, mother, I screamed at the sky, the black void. It took me a week to, a week to find weed. I had flown out of California with some in my carry-on, which I've been told by a friend's attorney husband is completely legal, but I'd smoked it all with the women who were in town for the Lantern residency. I went to a weirdo bar that served bad pizza, but was literally the only place to get food in town since all the grocery stores were closed and it was a Tuesday. At the weirdo bar, I met a couple, she 52, he 27. They sold me the rest of their weed, but only after they asked if they could fuck me in the bathroom. I said no, but when they asked for my number, I relented because I wanted to stay in touch in case I needed more weed or got horny down the road. That turned out to be a huge mistake since he wouldn't stop calling and later she left me a three minute voicemail about her feelings about it. I hid out in the house I was renting. I think I'll stop there. Oh, I love it. It's always great to start with burning flags in my yeah. opinion. And they're hard to burn, no matter even if you're not in the desert. That's exactly. what I learned. Now, I haven't had Confederate flags, but of course, there's that U.S. flag, which is just a different kind of Confederate flag, as we exactly. know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm planning on burning a thin blue line flag today. Oh, so. exciting! Exciting in honor of our event. <laughs> in honor of our event, and today is technically this is being filmed earlier. Today was the. Uh, Derek Chauvin uh, verdict. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm celebrating that. I love it. I love it. Um, well, maybe I'll read a little bit from the freezer door and then we'll chat about our books. I'm going to have a sip of water. And I'm going to read from like around the middle of the book. Suddenly, I'm remembering a public conversation between two great straight white male writers. We've all made the mistake of going to this event at least once, right? After great straight white male writer one reads, it's time for the Q and A. This is where we're supposed to find profound insight. The questions are always the same, so the answers can shine all the more brilliantly. Great straight white male writer two says to great straight white male writer one, who is your ideal audience? And great straight white male writer one says, everyone in my ideal audience is dead. It's hard to imagine anything more damaging to literature than questions about audience. Then again, it's hard to imagine anything more damaging to literature than literature. When people look at me with a mixture of horror and surprise, I think about the way the city of today is just a place for the gawkers to pretend they have a cosmopolitan outlook. Maybe it's a fashion thing, but it's also trauma. Can we ever separate fashion from trauma? I thought I was gonna walk through the cemetery, but instead I walk around the wall around the cemetery. So often there's more protection for the dead than for the living. It's obvious that a gated community is a graveyard. A graveyard has gates to protect the dead from the living. I'm worried that's what the city is becoming. Suburban suspicion repackaged as imagination. Consumption rebranded as creativity. Every new building looks like an office park. And we all know an office park is another kind of graveyard, walling off dreams in search of profit. A graveyard can be a beautiful place to imagine the dead and our lives that remain. 
to study the stones and names and look at the way that tree pushes those graves to the side. Another kind of history. A graveyard can be a respite from the living, even just to watch trees against sky, those clouds growing bolder. But we cannot live in a graveyard. The dream of the city is that you will find everything and everyone you never imagined. Does this possibility even exist anymore? I wonder what it feels like to be famous says the ice cube. It means you never have any privacy, says the ice cube tray. I don't really understand privacy, says the ice cube. I'm not sure how to respond to that, says the ice cube tray. I just wish there was a solution to beauty, says the ice cube. Do you mean a solution for beauty, asks the ice cube tray. I wish there weren't so many jokes about slipping, says the ice cube. Maybe a banana peel, I guess that one's okay. But when someone says you're on thin ice, it makes me feel like I'm never gonna amount to anything. I feel like we've been through this one before, says the ice cube tray. That's easy for you to say, says the ice cube. I'm just not offended as easily as you are says the ice cube tray. I'm not offended, says the ice cube. <clears throat> it's just that the whole world is telling me to click my heels together or snap my fingers or order something new from the menu or pick up the remote control or call room service or hide out in a fallout shelter or go on vacation or swallow a bunch of pills or go shopping for another pair of shoes or find a psychic healer or drown in my own sorrows. They might as well just cut the power cord. Thank you. <laughs> I, love, I it. love it. Thank you, Rhonda. It's funny, actually, I just remembered the event, that particular event, I mean, there are, of course, many, and we, they could be any, but the, between the two great straight white male writers actually took place not that far from Marfa and in the other desert artist colony town, uh, the larger one that was started before um, in what is now known as New Mexico. So um, that was in a grand theater in another very dry, dusty um, town full of, uh, well, I've never been to Marfa but I can speak for Santa Fe through full of the everyday aspects of colonialism and um, a level of, uh, I guess everywhere I've lived, I always think is the most depoliticized place I've ever lived. But when I lived in Santa Fe, I was like, nowhere comes close. <laughs> Matilda, why do you think we find ourselves, you know, to such like visibly queer um, and, and like kind of in a lot of ways, like very joyfully so and, and slutty as fuck. Like, why do you think we find ourselves in places like that? And yeah, like what, what, what what's the point? Like, why are we, why do we ever go there? Why are, why are we sent to be there? Why are we, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I feel like in a way, um, there is the whole world, right? <laughs> so in order to survive or try to figure out a way to thrive or meet people who will change us or will embrace us or will hold us or will help us, I feel like we're always forced to negotiate those spaces. Even, I guess for me, you know, one of the questions I ask in the freezer door is the ways in which even the queer spaces that I've been in for, you know, the last like two and a half decades and, you know, that have formed me and that I've helped to form where they also feel in many ways unwelcoming. And so I guess one of the things I'm exploring in the freezer door is, you know, going into places I already know are corrupt in order to find what isn't. Now there's some things, of course, the conversation between two great straight white male writers, we probably never need to engage with at all. Um, but I feel like there's some things that, um, I don't, I think desire, I guess that's the one in a certain way 
where desire, to find desire met, for me, often does mean going into these corrupt spaces. Um, what about for you? I feel like you have this great quote, actually, towards the end of the book that I love about, um, let's say you say, maybe there is not a duality of self, but a hexagonal. Maybe we have so many desires that we also have just as many selves. And what I love about that is allows for the possibility of desire really to change the world itself, right? To change the structure of feeling so that we can feel ourselves in different ways. And for me, that is a queer dream. And yeah. I love how you invoke that. Yeah, I, I agree with this. And I also love that there's a part in your book that I feel is like, it, that is in conversation with that where you talk about how imagined community is actually a way to describe heartbreak or at least one way to describe heartbreak. And in that particular moment, you're describing um, the rainbow crosswalks that, that lead to a police station. <laughs> <laughs> like what is happening, right? Like these police crosswalks, each of which cost $6,000 right? Money that could have gone to healthcare, which I think, right? Most queers are like, they want healthcare, they want housing, they want equal rights. Like those are the actual things that we need. And so, yeah, I think that the, what I wanted to talk about when, when I was saying that about like the hexagonal of the self or like these multi pointed sort of like ways of desiring and therefore being is, you know, there's also like so many different ways to be disappointed too and to be heartbroken by that desire the ways that world that we live in now and the way it currently functions is aware of maybe like one or two of those sides or of those desires right like it's so in love with the binary and it's so in love with you know imagining a community that doesn't actually include everyone and I feel like, I mean, this is a very American issue right now, but like today, you know, hearing, hearing all the different reactions to um, the verdict for George Floyd and hearing someone like Nancy Pelosi, who absolutely needs to not be in power whatsoever. She's been in power for 33 years, just saying something stupid about how Floyd died, you know, for justice. Like, no, that's actually not what happened. <laughs> Um, but yeah, yeah, I didn't, I, 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 I kind of wanted to talk more with you about like the ways that place, you know, like, I feel like we both interact so much with place and space in our books. Um, and one of my favorite parts is the sea lions, um, the sea lions that take over the pier after the earthquake in, in the eighties, is it? Um, and the way you talk about animals and veganism in general, like that porno scene where you're yelling a safe word. <laughs> so I guess my question is like, what did it look like when you, or, or how did you reach a place where you wanted to blend all of these together? Obviously it's on the surface, it's like, oh, we're humans and animals and we live on land. But what was it that like kind of connected that? with the rest of the threads in the book for you? Oh, that's so interesting. I think in a way the book, in the book I'm, you know, it's a search for embodiment or a search for a way in which I can have a body that doesn't just feel like loss, right? And so I'm searching for connection in this gentrified landscape of Seattle that is pushing against that at every point, right? And so, um, and in that search for embodiment, you know, I come, embodiment of course does mean pleasure and it does mean desire and intimacy, but it also means longing and abandonment and desperation and devastation. And so it's all there, right? It's all interwoven. And um, that's such an interesting question about, I feel like, um, yeah, because as you were saying that about the sea lions or about, um, veganism, I think that's interwoven because that is also embodiment for me, 
Um, and I think, oh, or the trees is another really good example. Now, I had no idea when I started writing this book that the trees would have any role in it. But the trees in Seattle, you know, like when everyone lets me down, which is frequently, <laughs> um, at least I have the trees. I can lean on the trees. I can balance my, you know, back on the shrubs. You know, I can relax. And, but even that, is a threat to people, you know? So I'll be like leaning against a, a hedge. Like what could be a better reason for a hedge? Someone walking by will be like, oh my God. Oh, just like, you know, like moving away, like, whoa, something really bad is happening, you know? And um, I think, you know, that point you made earlier about how community or justice um, are used as ways to oppress everyone you know, or to continue systemic injustice um, or to, um, you know, that that's sort of what I, um, in a way I want to challenge that. The phone is ringing. <laughs> I left the phone on, it's my landline. So at least we're getting some landline realness. I can run and turn it off, but it gives us a little bit of like atmosphere, right? Um, but I think I, um, yeah, so for me, I wanted to get into the felt sense of, of that disappointment and devastation um, on a quest for connection, right? And, mm -hmm. and I think I hadn't actually thought on a, such a micro level uh, about, you know, the relationship of animals, um, but I feel like that is part of that ecosystem that we're all in, you know, the animals, the trees, like seeing a random person on the street, you know, the, all these interactions that we have or the light, you know, on a building at a certain time of day. Um, for me, all of that is part, and sometimes I get way more from those interactions than I do from the people who are always letting me down, right? And in fact, the phone, now that I think of it, is a big theme in the book, right? Like, because I have this question about, well, I say that voicemail in some ways is what keeps a lot of my relationships going and no one wants to use voicemail anymore, right? And, and also that I resist texting because I want to create a text for my life, you know, that I can live in. Um, and, and I feel like in your book also, there is, so you have this very interesting structure of the book that I think is, in some ways, it's kind of deceptively simple, right? You say, I'm going on a road trip, across country in 2016 to, um, to experience the United States that might elect Trump, right? And, but then like it starts that way, but then it becomes like, really it's a tour through your entire life. And some of it is on this road trip. And a lot of it is in, you know, your bodily memory, you know, and your experience of the world and your, um, coming of age and coming into self. Um, and so I wonder if you want to talk about how you created that structure in a way that is very deceptively simple, but is actually incredibly complicated and very layered um, and also very pared down at the same time. Um, yeah, it was, it was just so many drafts, you know, and I think I, I read in your acknowledgments that you didn't know you were starting your book in 2014, but that's kind of where you started it. Right. And I felt the same way. I was, you know, I was writing all these chapters about all these different ways that my body was experiencing the world and the ways that I was seeing, especially like for me after the Egyptian revolution in 2011 in, in January 25, and just seeing all these different ways that, people movements were trying so hard to push against, you know, what was coming, which was all of this fascism and the ways that I had experienced that, like such a, at such an early age and at such a cellular level from my family members, parents, um, masculine people that I had dated and been in love with, governments, um, academic institutions, institutions in general, and there was just like such a huge list that I found myself very like easily coming up with this material and writing all of this material, but I wanted to shape it in a way that 
did a couple of things. One was mirror the way that my body is not usually at ease, right, in the world that we live in as a fat femme and just in general. And then the ways that um, other people's bodies tend to be, especially if you have privilege in the US, right? Um, it was kind of my reply to, you know, white women's road trip stories where it's like, oh, I have to go and, con- or, 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 you know, straight people's ideas of like conquering nature by going on like a five week hike or some shit. You know, like having this like very troubled and troubling, you know, relationship with the natural world and the way that that is rooted in colonialism. So it's yeah, it was just all of these different layers of kind of wanting to be in a lot of ways like a troll to, you know, white, straight, whateverness, um, while also invoking this kind of, um, you know, tradition of the road story, but like the road story for a Palestinian is just not going to be a normal road story. Um, and like one of, so one of the moments in your book that I really liked that I could relate to was, and what you're saying just now about like leaning against a tree or just generally like how, you know, those of us who are connecting to nature in ways that aren't like as long as we're not wearing like bike shorts or, you know, those weird like claw footed shoes, right? Like, like I feel, it feels like we have to in America wear a costume in order to interact with nature in a way that's acceptable. So you leaning against the hedge is just, you're just a weirdo, right? But then later, like there's a part in the book where, you know, you're being fucked against a tree and you're describing the way the tree is also like part of this desire and the pleasure of the moment and the way that it it feels like cork, right? And then later you walking down the street and we've seen you kind of, I think it's like kind of similar to your walk to Pony to go dancing, right? You're like walking down the street after the sex and you're like farting. You're like, because you're going downhill, you're letting all this gas out. And so I just love how you become you become such a such a such an integral and like normal part of that landscape when all of those interactions happen. So can you do? You, I mean, we can talk about that. Um, I w- I would want to hear more about you know the ways that you were you, were you like taking were you journaling during this time? Are these are these like tiny memories that you were holding somehow? Um, how did the, how did those moments find their way into your book? Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. So, um, yeah, like you said, when I started writing, I had no idea what the hell I was doing. I was just writing anything that was interesting to me and putting it in one document. And I think that document itself probably started like somewhere around 2012. And um, and then, you know, things would become interesting to me. And so I would just put them in. And so there were themes, but I had no intention of what was going to happen. And it wasn't until... Yeah, like somewhere around 2016, I think, um, when I was like, oh, I think I know what this is doing. It was actually, I was invited to do a reading series where it was just one reader and the theme was about Seattle. And I was like, oh, well, this is my writing about Seattle. So I knew the part that I thought was the most polished and I just pulled it out. And that actually became the beginning of the book. That was when I realized, oh, I have a beginning of a book. And I also was like that quest where I first end up at, at this bar, this gay bar pony that you mentioned, um, where I've avoided gay bars for so long because what the hell is there for me? You know, I already know like, um, you know, these like racist, misogynist, like femphobic um, spaces of like, you know, internalized and externalized hatred. <laughs> uh, but I get there and I feel everything that I already know, like the shade, the shame, the sadness, but also there's a sweetness. And so I'm like, oh, that's what I'm looking for is that sweetness and I need it in order to be alive. And for me, desire, um, desire isn't, it, desire is desire to get fucked, but it's also desire just to exist in the world with other bodies, with other people, with other, with the air, with, um, 
you know, sitting on the bus and someone's leg touches your leg, like that, that can be desire, you know, desire can be gardening, desire can be, um, you know, talking on the phone with someone and that sudden, you know, rush of intimacy. And um, so for me, I don't want, I guess in the book, I'm, I'm pushing against these, these boundaries, these borders that are in my mind, completely artificial and antithetical to like my survival and, you know, and I think everyone's survival, you know, and, um, and so in writing about sex, I think I'm always writing about the landscape. I mean, of course, I, when I'm writing about sex in the park, but also I feel like that, I guess that's something that I, I don't know that I was as aware of. I mean, after like, I don't know, a few decades of having these experiences, <laughs> I've become very aware of the space, you know, and like the beauty of that, like getting fucked inside of a rhododendron bush. I mean, come on, you know, and like, it, it feels to me much more, I don't know. I feel like some people like look at these stories and they're like, they feel like, oh, wow. Or like, oh, sensation or, you know, like sensational, you know, like for me, I guess it's that difference between sensational and sensation, right? For me, it's just, this is just everyday experience, you know? And I actually, um, like I, but, but also the thing that I'm pushing against is the ways that in these spaces that don't have to, there are literally no boundaries in this park, like in the literal sense. There's no fence, there are no walls. Um, it is technically closed, but there's nothing that closes. <laughs> but people's interactions are gated still, you know, and there is still this obsession with this kind of um, normative masculinity or this obsession with not talking or this obsession with not communicating at all, really, you know, and like, and how that is always pushing against my autonomy or my bodily self. And I'm sort of, I feel like in a, in a way, the sensation of the, the bark of the tree is part of me, like finding a space for myself anyway, like, no one's giving me that, you know, but I, I can find it, you know, even it's, it's just an intuitive thing, you know, and, um, and I think actually you have this great part in your book, um, where you talk about, there's a chapter about BDSM and how in these, um, spaces, uh, that are mostly queers of color, um, and, all different kinds of bodies and all different kinds of desires um, where you feel a kind of sense of safety, I think you use that word, that you have not felt in, um, you know, normative or like so-called vanilla, um, you know, sex that people think of as being like not dangerous, right? That's the safe kind of sex. And you're like, well, that's actually what threatened me. And this is where I'm finding a kind of liberation. And I, you have this question that I really like, um, or it's like a, it's a couple of questions that circle around each other and they, they're both literal and figurative, you know, where you ask, um, what is the knife? Right. And the knife, of course, in a BDSM space is a literal thing. Right. But also, um, and where is the knife? And um, so I wonder if, if, if you want to talk, because I love that the way you flip, I think you're flipping uh, like our expectations and you're also flipping literal and figurative. And I wondered if you want to talk about how those questions figure into your own um, search for um, self and embodiment and pleasure and autonomy. That's so good. There's, so yeah, there's, there's this, there's this moment, I think that it's not, it doesn't, doesn't just happen once, it happens often, I think, if you're a person in the world where you realize that even gay culture can and you you have this in your book actually how it that it mimics straight masculinity like the worst aspects of straight masculinity can be mimicked in gay culture so you know in the scene in my book it's you know where this woman is there's 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 a scene where uh it's happening in two different places and times one is a woman 
uh, during a sex party and she's with a cis man and he's like basically offering her body to be fucked without her permission. And then the other one is, or without her consent, so not in a sexy way. And then the other is, you know, uh, a woman laying on her back and being fucked by a play knife while like a butch daddy is like, you know, in control of everything. And yeah, for me, like I've definitely noticed spaces where even if, you know, like for example, the Lex in San Francisco and groped at the Lex without my consent and all of that stuff. But like, you kind of, at some point you kind of expect this from all, every time I leave my house, I'm like something, something dangerous might happen, uh, which I think both of our books are completely in agreement about like that. There is no safety really. Um, it's a fantasy. And yeah, for me personally, I feel like a lot of, you know, like the really good outdoor sex I've had that has been safe was usually in my yard or whatever yard of whatever house I was renting. Um, and herein comes like this fantasy of real estate, which you also talk about, right? Like this fantasy of controlling your space or controlling how you're going to live. Um, it's just not, it's just not real. And I think that, I think definitely when I'm, when I'm talking about the knife, I am talking about masculinity or I'm talking about, like penetrative masculinity in some ways and the dangers that lie there. Um, so there's, for me, like there's a really awesome part of your book where you talk about masculinity and it's the top of page 207. Um, sometimes I think the main tension among faggots is between those who see masculinity as a burden and those who see it as a pleasure between those who see masculinity as a refuge and those who see it as refuse. Masculinity is an ideal and the ideal of refusing masculinity. Um, I love that. I love that so much. Do you, do you also, do you want to like talk more about this as a kind of danger or problem that we constantly have to deal with <laughs> because we breathe. Uh, I mean, I think, um, yeah, I, I feel like um, what I'm pushing against is, you know, I think the duality is interesting and the problem is that the wrong side has won, right? And so the dominant, you know, dominant gay culture, you know, mimics like, as you said before, like the worst aspects of straight normalcy. So, it, and, but in some ways it's even worse because straight men have been forced by feminism to actually understand. Now it does not mean they, they actually change anything, but they understand like rape culture on some level, or they have a sense that, and again, they might just be like, this is great. I'm going to participate in it. But right. I feel like gay culture in many ways, it's this conscious rejection of feminism among people who are formed by feminism. Like there would be no gay culture without feminism. It just wouldn't even exist, right? Like, and uh, and so when there are gay men, you know, but there, there, this sort of deification of this hyper-masculine, um, basically straight macho culture, as the pinnacle of achievement, right? Like something we can never question, you know, and we see that play out politically, right? In terms of like gays in the military, you know, and we see that play out socially in the sense of like femmes, you know, or trans people, women, like those are all, keep them away. You know, anyone that is unwilling or unable to conform to basically white middle-class norms. You know, those, no, no, no. You know, and I live in the gay neighborhood and I talk about this in the book a lot. Like I walk out in the street and there are fags everywhere. And, you know, I'll see people who are like looking at me with like interest and I get closer and they go like this, you know, or like I might say hi and they're like, you know, cause it's like, I'm the wrong kind of faggot, right? And because I'm refusing those norms, you know, and it's obvious, right? It's like in every gesture and every movement. And, and I derive a lot of pleasure from that. But, all, you know, from that refusal, um, but coming up against, 
it's like, it's interesting because I think when I was like 18 or 19, um, first entering the world as an avowedly queer person and realizing, you know, like I did not have access to gay culture as a kid. You know, that was, there was nothing, you know, there were like closeted gay teachers like that everyone made fun of, you know. Um, there was, you know, a, na- a neighborhood I knew about, but it, there was a gay neighborhood, but like, but I had no access, you know, there were no. I grew up similarly, except in a gay culture that thought it was straight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Arabs think they're straight. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah, it's like, but then when I, you know, come, came, like, I think I remember the first time I went, when I moved to San Francisco and I was 19 in 1992, and people were like, you're going to find everything you wanted here. And I get there and it's this like hyper masculine, you know, gay men who are looking at me like I'm, tra- I'm with my best friend who's a dyke. They're looking at me like I'm trash and she doesn't exist. And that was when all that, that's all it took. I was like, I will never find anything here. But now it's interesting, 25 years later, um, or more than 25 years later, <laughs> I'm almost 30 years later. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> I'm still, I'm like uh, 26. Um, but, um, the, I'm have I just had this realization in conversation actually that like, that actually was a shock that I don't know I've ever recovered from, but I couldn't experience it as shock then because I had to defend myself. I had to be alive, right? So it was just like, oh, of course, I know that, you know. <laughs> you know, and it was also because I was coming of age, yeah. you know, as the queer person at a time of mass death, you know, like everyone was dying of AIDS and drug addiction and suicide. And like that had to be normal in order to live, you know, like I was part of ACT UP and, you know, like people would, um, you know, like you, you I, I don't know, like I would go on the bus and they're just people who are like weeks away from dying or I would meet someone and like, oh, you know, you'd have like a flirtatious exchange. And then like a month or two later, I'd be like, well, I wonder where that girl is. And and she was dead, you know? And, um, and so all of that trauma um, compounded at once and having to negotiate that. And then there's this artificial trauma of gay masculinity, like, in some ways in response to the AIDS crisis, but also just a longer history, you know, in response to like, it's the wrong response to like, you know, sort of people are like, oh, we're not sissies. We're like proud, you know, men, you know. I mean, the right response is like, of course we're sissies, you know what I mean? Yeah. Let's bring it on. But so I feel like gay culture has made all of the wrong choices and we're living the consequences of that. And, um, but I think at the same time, and I think you're doing this a lot in your book, um, like pushing against, like we have to push against these norms and dictates that are constantly squashing us, you know, in all of our complications. And I feel like one of the ways you're doing that, I think you have this, um, you talk about in the book how like, trying to think of how you phrase it exactly, but you say like being a Palestinian in the United States, it's this, or actually you're you're speaking more broadly about being Arab in the United States and how there is this requirement of invisibility. Um, But then there's also this hyper visibility when it comes to like white supremacist, racist um, attacks, you know? And, um, And then I feel like, I don't know. I really like, I like the, I love the way that you, so like one example you give is like after Barbara Bush died, you know, and um, you have this very clear, succinct Twitter post where you say that she was a smart, generous, and amazing racist who along with her husband raised a war criminal. That's just, you know, that's just basic history, right? And, and then you receive in response, like, you know, death threats and like almost a thousand harassing emails. And so it's by telling the truth of her legacy, you become visible, (laughs) like as an Arab, as like a gorgeous, luscious, like fat, um, you know, queer. 
and, and then targeted for all those things. Oh, and here's the quote, to be Arab in America is to be unwittingly dunked into a paint pot of invisibility ink. And, but then here's the visibility when you're a target. And so I wonder if you wanna talk about that duality and how you push up against it. Yeah, I think, well, I think the hardest thing for a racist, homophobic, basic bitch of a person um, today is wrapping their minds around the idea that a person can have a ton of identities and a ton of, you know, intersectional identities. Um, and I don't want to like say this to like kind of give them a free whatever, because, you know, it's not like being basic is a disease or is it? Um, but yeah, I think because, you know, whenever, whenever someone who's femme says anything, right, in the public sphere, the first thing that happens is there's a comment on their appearance, right? So there's like, oh, who does she think she is? You know, I tend to, at the time, I wore a lot of flowers in my hair, like they made fun of that. They basically made fun of any femme thing that was connected to me and my body. So, you know, like my secondary sex organs, my, just like everything, my, my large arms, just ev anything and everything they could focus on. And then the greatest thing was that a lot of them were saying she is white. Look at her. She looks white. So why is she even saying this? And it's like, well, if I were white, you wouldn't give a shit. If I were white and I wore a suit and I was Roger Stone, the greatest closeted queer in all of history, possibly, right? He said that Barbara Bush, that if anyone lit a match around her, she would blow up because she was such a drunk. And so he said that after she died and no one cared. It was great. It was a wonderful quote from a, from a hateful, despicable person. But like, Roger Stone is a white man who wears suits every day, right? Like he, wear, he wears a top hat. He looks like the fucking Monopoly man, you know? Like that's who this guy is. So he's allowed to say that. Um, so yeah, it just, it, it's always really interesting to me the ways that when I, when I see my identities kind of all coming together to create this like giant mind fuck um, for someone who just cannot fathom the multi-layered ways that, you know, we can be. Um, yeah. And I also think that um, there's something about, I, I love what you were saying earlier about being femme and walking down the street and being invisible. So like in my, even in my own communities, right? Like I often felt growing up that I wasn't gay enough because I was attracted to femmes. I wasn't really attracted to masculine folks when I was younger. Um, and that just was like a no-no, you know? Um, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to find femme for femme love. It's very difficult because of the way that masculinity is prized, right? And held up. Um, so it puts me in kind of this weird place where I want to be loved. I want to feel love. I want to, I want to fuck. And at the same time, like I also speak openly and freely about what I believe. Um, and then I'm told like, no, you should actually go back to Africa or wherever it is that you're from, because maybe there you'll realize how important and easy it is to live here where you can say whatever you want. It's such a mind fuck. It's like, well, I am saying whatever I want. You're telling me I can't. Um, this is a random aside, but I love that you talk trash about Kathy Acker in your book for like one second. <laughs> um, yeah, I've never liked her. So yeah, I mean, like, that's just, you know, I love when you're like, she just like leads people on. And right. And it's like, she gets away. I feel like it was her masculinity that allowed her kind of like this, 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 this way of becoming a saint, um, in our communities. So anyway, yeah, I can, I can continue talking shit, but. <laughs> yeah, I feel like the, it's interesting. I feel like the Kathy Acker part in the book, there are these, um, I guess for me, I don't believe in icons. And um, 
And so even the people like uh, like David Wanarovich, who is the closest thing to an icon for me, you know, because when I first read Close to the Knives, it was the first time like I felt my rage at a world that wanted me to die or disappear. Um, and then simultaneously a feeling of maybe a little bit of hope in a world of loss. And when I first discovered his work, I felt like, because I discovered him in an obituary, you know, he had just died of AIDS. And um, I felt such for years, like such a deep sadness that I never was able to know him. But then over the years, the more that I know about him, like, and even though I still honor his work and it has meant more than anyone's work to me and continues um, to mean that, I also am aware of the ways in which his masculinity probably would have made me not, I would not have wanted to be in the same room with him. <laughs> And, and so for me, I want, I feel like in terms of honoring the people that um, we respect, we also have to like look at um, their failures, you know, and, uh, and the Kapiaka scene is an interesting one because Kapiaka, when I lived in San Francisco, uh, my, you know, when I was 19, you know, she was like, uh, she was teaching at San Francisco Art Institute and, um, so she was basically like a living deity, you know, in dyke culture in San Francisco, which was the culture that formed me. And um, and everyone was like, oh my God, Kathy Acker is gonna fall in love with me. <laughs> and these were mostly like 20 somethings, you know, Kathy Acker, uh, you know, I'm not sure how old she was then, but you know, like several decades older. Um, and, um, and I, my only interaction, this one time I had a friend who lived in a warehouse space and Kathy Ackert agreed to perform. And, you know, she drives up on her motorcycle, um, you know, uh, shows up. And I think for me, I was already biased against her because I was like, there are all these dykes who are in love with Kathy Acker and she's not gonna, she's not gonna be in love with them. She has no interest. And, but, uh, but everyone else was just like, whoa, Kathy Acker. And then, you know, and so in the book, I think I'm going, I feel, I think I say something like, I could see the way that the image was driving her, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and so, but at the same time, there's, I think I, I kind of want to circle back around myself because of course her project as a writer was that the text, well, among many things, but that the person or the persona can create the text and the text can create the persona and there, there is no separation, right? And right. so I sort of want to circle back around because you know the book that, The Freezer Door is a book that is built around um, rupture in a way, you know, fragmentation. And for me, you know, it starts with one problem with gentrification is that it always gets worse and that's just, one line alone on a page, right? And then you have to like, you turn the page and you're like, whoa, what just happened? Because that's the landscape in which the book is taking place. And the way that the text breaks, it's when the emotion can no longer hold, right? And so I wanted to look, um, I think throughout, I'm looking for those gaps, you know, wherever the gap, and like you said, you know, your my text came came about through the editing. Like it started with like a thousand pages of like, I don't even know what it was. <laughs> I don't even call it a draft. I'm like, this is the material. <laughs> um, and then I just add it and add it and add it and add it. And I really, you know, I, I sense that, like your book is very different formally, but it's a similar uh, editing. Well, or I felt that, that kinship in terms of, um, you know, and also in terms of the way that you're able to articulate these really complicated um, experiences of like desire and abuse and intimacy and being, you know, uh, abandoned um, and abused and um, let down, but still searching for those connections. And what one example that just like devastated me and so quickly, it was just like, boom. It's where you're talking about this boyfriend that you had when you were 17. And you talk about when, you know, he starts uh, becoming physically abusive. 
um, and how you grew up, you know, in an abusive household where your father is abusing your mother, your father is abusing you. And so when you first, when he first hits you, you just think, oh, maybe that was an accident. <laughs> um, and, and then it happens in public and you, and someone, you know, says, you don't have to take that. And then you think, oh, this might be a pattern. And then you start to describe the pattern. And then there, there's this shift. And I think it's one of the only times you do, might be the only time you do this in the book, but it's, it's at least one of the few times where you shift to directly addressing the reader. Mm -hmm. And you say, you're thinking I left this guy soon after. And of course that was what I was thinking. I was like, okay, this is developing to um, telling us, okay, and then I realized, okay, you know, cause that's a, a more standard narrative that we are told. And then you say, um, but actually I married him and I had a baby with him. And I feel like, and this, this chapter is called What Love Is. And um, I think it makes me want to ask the question. Well, first of all, it makes me feel it. Like I felt everything. And that, just in that moment, I was like, whoa. It's like all the energy goes whoo into my body, you know, because I'm really feeling it. And it's not that I wouldn't have felt it otherwise, but it brought me directly into it, you know? Um, and, and then it makes me want to ask that question about how do we break that cycle of violence? And I think at the same time, I feel like you're answering that question by how you're telling the story, you know, because you're saying this is everything, right? It's not, there isn't this formula. You know, we don't have that easy answer. Like, and so I wondered if you wanted to talk more about how you developed that, um, all of it, you know, the analytical part, the felt sense, and also the way you're doing it formally in this very pared down way, right? It's just like methodical and direct. And then at the same time, totally unexpected. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, that that definitely was one of the toughest chapters. And I wanted to show the ways that, I mean, when this was happening, I didn't have access to internet. I didn't have access to like, you know, I couldn't just put a little like, um, you know, poll on Twitter or Instagram being like, should I dump him? Yes, no. Like, if I dump him, will someone come get me? Can someone protect me? <laughs> I don't want to go to a shelter. Will I be okay? Um, I can't tell my parents because they are like, you know, um, just deranged people who are very misogynist and don't think women should date. So what do I do? And I think that like, my my thing about writing this book was being able to go back to time travel so that I can actually be there for myself at that time. So a lot of what I'm doing in the book is figuring out ways to literally step back and step through, right, whatever the, you know, our, our imaginary idea of what time is. Um, basically just being like, yes, Yes to, you know, Black feminists and French uh, feminist writers, like time is circular. So let me just kind of hop back into this pattern and be there for myself back then. And so a lot of it had to do with reporting, really just being a witness to what happened to me back then, remembering, even though it was painful to remember and chronicling it in a way that showed you know, how easily it is to miss a pattern, how easy it is. Someone, someone, you know, I love memes and someone posted a meme that was like, what if I did see the red flags and I just really wanted to fuck them? You know, like what happens when you are actually aware that you're about to, you know, enter a situation where you're going to be harmed and, you think you have control, you think you can exit, but you actually cannot because, you know, it's, it's a dangerous, it's a dangerous thing. Um, so yeah, I think 
that chapter just took the longest to to get down, but also the longest to edit because the more I had to go back to those scenes of violence, the harder. It was just very difficult. And I didn't want to numb myself. Um, yeah, I wanted to be present while I was editing those scenes. So every time I would go in, I would just tell myself, like, you're doing this for you. You're doing this as a time travel experiment to be there for yourself back then and to show up for yourself. And maybe someone will read this and recognize that they're in an abusive relationship and, and hopefully be able to leave it, you know? Um, but yeah, one of the things that, one of the, the things that I've heard back about that chapter from people is I've heard uh, people say, you know, thank you for saying that the sex was really good because there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, victims of this kind of violence that, you know, we were ashamed to say, like, actually, like, we were having incredible orgasms in, in between these terrible moments. And that's a big part of how we kept going, you know, um, and that the abuser knows the power of pleasure and how much like someone who doesn't respect boundaries and is abusive can actually also be a really good lover and the contradictions there and how painful that is to contend with. Um, so just, yeah, like the rest of the book, I just wanted it to be honest and I wanted it to be raw and um, yeah. We are at 60 minutes. I feel like that might be a great place to end. I want to be honest. I want to be raw. That seems, let's let's end right there. That sounds great. Love it. All right. Um, okay. Well, then I think uh, that was our conversation. Um, <laughs> thank you all for joining us. Um, thanks to uh, Matilda Bernstein-Sycamore. Thanks to Randa Girard. Um, you can find both of their latest books at our um, book selling partner, Paragraph Books, at paragraphbooks.com, I want to say. Um, you can look for info about them on our website, on our Facebook, on our social media. Um, yeah, there it is. <laughs> and the other one. Hold up yours too, run that. There we go. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, find them online. Um, get them read. They're great, great, great books. Um, thanks again for joining us. Good night. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>